if your orchestra is continually playing the pain tune for your back, can you somehow put a different conductor on the podium and get them mm. to play something else? Mm. I love the way you're running with the metaphor, <laughs> Margaret. Um, absolutely, well, I, I believe you can. Well, it makes sense on this network, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Um, I believe you can. I mean, for for the last 30 years, we've we've had this mantra, really, to say, okay, when you've got chronic pain, the pain is unavoidable and the suffering is optional. And I think that mantra now is biologically indefensible. I think that when we know that we can teach people to cope with their pain, manage their pain better, and again, the people at North Shore, gee, they're, they're good. A guy called Michael Nicholas has written a book called uh, Manage Your Pain, fantastic book, all about how to cope and how to manage. What we now know uh, is that actually we can, we can train the system to stop producing this output. That process is a long journey because we're trying to convince the brain that what it's thought was very dangerous for the last six months, six years, 60 years, is not actually dangerous. And that's not a trivial task to teach the brain that. Wow. The, the process that, that we go through to do that, I guess, is understanding, make people realise, give them the resources to realise that when their pain gets worse, it's because their brain is protecting them, not because they've made an injury worse. These are people with chronic pain. Mm. Uh, and once they can understand that, then we can embark on the process of identifying every single trigger that the brain thinks is relevant to the danger to, to your back. Can you tell me about taking pain medication? Some of the studies that have been done about what pain medication looks like, the shape and colour of pills, for instance. Mm. I mean, that's really interesting that's work, cool, isn't it? That's isn't it? Just yeah. tell us what's, what's going on there. Oh, that, no, that's really cool. And we've called that probably uh, misleadingly placebo and we've, a lot of people have heard of placebo mm -hmm. and there was a myth that 30 percent of people responded to placebos and that's a myth if if you get given uh, a pill that you think is an analgesic that it's worked before that it's it's, it's removed some of the signs of danger which are, are pain and you take that pill then you should get pain relief because you're doing something that the orchestra should consider mm -hmm. say okay well you've taken this action Things are not as dangerous as they were, therefore I won't produce as much pain. If you subsequently find out that that pill is not an analgesic but is an inert molecule, the brain had no way of knowing that. So if you have a pill that's actually half, it's a capsule, and half of it has lots of little red balls in it, and the other half is blue, and your, your brain will take that into consideration and quite possibly think, gee, this is going to be effective. And if we can accept that pain is, is an output of the brain, it's produced by the brain like the orchestra plays a tune, if the brain has good reason to reduce that protective device, then it will. And different coloured pills uh, affect that. So you're saying there's no physiological effect of a, of a pain relief? Oh, no, there, there is, absolutely. If uh, We know that the chemicals that are in these substances, so when you have a Panadol or Paracetamol of any description... We know the molecule attaches onto receptors and reduces the activation of okay. danger systems. Mm -hmm. We know that happens. If it's happened every time you've had a paracetamol, then your brain should predict the future and say, right, great, no point still producing this output. But if they make paracetamol in blue square ta tablets, they don't work as well as if they're white, long, the ones that people are so familiar with. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and when they produce a new a, a new whiz bang looking capsule and call it something slightly different that sounds really analgesic, it'll have a better response to to a, to pain relief because your brain is in charge. But it can be exactly the same composition as the stuff stuff you've been taking. All exactly the, the same molecule. Yeah, the very. famous brands work better than the less famous brands for that reason. Isn't that interesting? Do they in studies? Yeah. And 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 the famous brands protect the colours of their packs Absolutely like they a, do. to the highest court of the land, don't they? Yeah. Because yep. people identify, I think it's green and red or whatever it is. Yeah. Is the is the colour of choice of people that yep. they think those are the ones that are going to work. We've been talking about pain. We'll just take a short break from that to hear more about you and how you got into it. How, I mean, did you come to it via a medical degree or some other way? Okay. Well, I did a physiotherapy degree. And I worked as a physiotherapist, but I guess why? Why does one? You sort of always do things that 
betray your interests and things like that. And I guess... Um, had you had injuries yourself? Or? Yeah, I used to play football, soccer, mm. and I, I uh, hurt my coccyx. I have the, the proud uh, ability to say that I've had a coccygectomy, which is always a conversation killer. But uh, I blew up my coccyx and they had to take out all the bits and I was hurting for a while. And the things that I learnt in biological sciences, doing a physiotherapy degree, didn't seem to fit with the things that I learnt in clinical sciences and but i guess in what that way did they not fit uh that we would we were treating pain as though it was in the tissues and the biological sciences clearly tells us that it's an important contributor to pain but it's not the thing that decides the brain decides mm. and i guess that theme has continued but i guess really pain for me is it's it's a human experience and it's such an intense ubiquitous human experience and i'm really interested in humans have you always been I think so. Did you grow up in a family that was sort of empathic and sensitive to human beings? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That Tell was us sort about of, them. Tell well, us about your mother sort of and father. Encouraged, I guess. Um, I love the sound of your dad, <laughs> Mr. Roundabout. Mr. Man. Roundabout Man. Yeah, you Tell can, me that. You here. can blame my father for the roundabouts in Canberra. Really? Um, what does he yes. an engineer? He's a town planner, mm. uh, and yeah, really a really significant contribution to. To Canberra, although he'll he'll be cringing right now. Will he? Yes. Sorry, tell us Dad. about. Well, sorry, Dad, but um, tell us about the garden path. Oh well, this is my moment of confessing that when I had to put in the path to the incinerator, a, a bit of a Christmas holidays job, and I said, "No worries, Dad," and I put in a beautiful straight path. Came back the next holidays, and Dad had dug it up and put in a nice curly one. <laughs> he couldn't get the roundabouts out of he his. He couldn't. Mind. No, no. So, did you grow up in Canberra? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, Great place to grow up. Is it? Why? Yeah. Well, I think I probably grew up when we were um, in the lap of luxury with Commonwealth funding, I guess. I, I don't really know, but we had you know, beautiful green ovals everywhere and facilities to die for. And and still, Canberra is a beautiful place. Mm. It really is. And it's a great place to run around in. What did your mum do? Mum was a teacher uh, and then later on got into um, counselling adult survivors of, of child abuse. And uh, so mum's always sort of, you know, demonstrated what it's like to really care about people. And that's a, a really precious mm. gift to give your kids. And I think I think me and both of my brothers, you can see that sort of intent on, on in, enjoying, but also, I guess, um, being collegial with humankind. Mm. And, Did you and, do your doctorate at Oxford or was that after the doc- doctorate? Doctorate at Sydney. So uh, Faculty of Medicine at Sydney, I did a doctorate and then a postdoc in Queensland and then I went to Oxford What University. did you do there? Uh, I was a research fellow, really. So I did research and that was really on the brain uh, and to do with pain stuff so when did you get into pain when was it the, was it the physio that because i mean as a physiotherapist you're seeing people in pain all the time mm. aren't you is that when it started to yeah yeah i guess clinically i'd see these people with a long history of pain and i'm probably someone who sees a, a problem that seems too big and try and take it on and uh, i think i saw on a tv ad somewhere or something someone said you know you you bite off more than you can chew and you chew like hell and I guess that was a real red rag to a bull. Mm. These people who we weren't helping them, they weren't getting help anywhere. And I thought, let's find more about out more, find more more out. Does that make sense? Find more out about, about this. Yes. Learn more about pain. Did this? Yeah. Did you have moments in your life as a clinician or as a as a researcher where the scales fell from your eyes and you thought, ah, oh, you know, that that you had to alter your whole perspective on pain. Uh, I'm not sure, Margaret. That's a great question. Um, I don't. I don't think I remember a particular sort of aha moment. So uh, you've started with the sort of the beginnings of the knowledge you now have, and you've just, in, you know. Yeah, I think so. I, I think to, I've, I've, as long as I can remember, I, I had this sense of uh, we, we can't presume to know what it's like to be someone else, and when someone's telling us they hurt and it doesn't fit with our clinical model. We can either choose that to believe they're lying or our clinical model is inadequate. And I guess I've always chosen the mm. latter.